Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, and this week I have a little bit of a problem. I can't make my mind up about something, uh, and hopefully you guys will be able to help me out with it. What are you talking about, Jingles? Well, as you may or may not be aware, British battleships are incoming to World of Warships. And in anticipation of their coming, I've been furiously grinding away and stockpiling as much free experience in World of Warships as I can get my grubby little hands on. At the moment I've got just over 210,000, which, if British battleships came out tomorrow, would mean I would probably be able to blast my way straight through to Tier 6, possibly Tier 7. And in the tech tree as it's currently been revealed, that would mean I would almost certainly be able to unlock HMS King George V. And depending on how long it takes for these British battleships to actually appear in the game, they're going to be arriving soon, but I don't know exactly when, I may have three or even 400,000 free XP to blow, in which case I might actually be able to blast my way through HMS Monarch at Tier 8 and pick up HMS Lion at Tier 9. Hang on a minute, Jingles, are you sure that's a good idea? I mean, if you're just going to free experience your way through all of the ships, you're going to end up with a Tier 9 battleship and no idea of how to play it, based on, you know, the experience that you would normally have gained by playing your way up Tier 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. Ah, well, yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? However, comma, Wargaming are up to their old tricks again. Do you remember when they gave us British cruisers and they were unlike all of the other cruisers in the game? Well, British battleships are going to be unlike all of the other battleships in the game as well. In fact, some of the British battleships are going to be unlike other British battleships. What the hell are you talking about, Jingles? Have you finally lost the plot? Well, allow me to explain. Here's the official blurb. British battleships have two distinctive features that make them ideal for medium-range battles. Wait, medium-range battles? Yeah. The improved repair party consumable and increased penetration rate of their high-explosive shells. Now, this doesn't mean that British battleships are going to be completely useless at long range, or at least I hope not. That remains to be seen. But at medium range, there are a couple of things here that make them unique. First, they're going to have the best repair party consumable in the game. They're going to be able to recover more health when they use their repair party consumable than an equivalent battleship of another nation. Um, in a similar way to the way the HMS Warspite's repair party works. Warspite does have a very, very good repair party. But also, all of their main caliber guns are going to have increased penetration on their high explosive shells. So what that means is that, well, when you're engaging another battleship and it turns nose on towards you and starts bow tanking, suddenly you're Unless you're in a Yamato, your armor-piercing shells become mostly useless. And so you have to switch to high explosive. But when you're firing high explosive shells at the front of a battleship, you tend to get a lot of shatters, and the damage that you do is inconsistent. Well, that shouldn't be the case with a British battleship, thanks to the increased penetration on their high explosive main battery shells. You should be able to do much more consistent damage until you're close to close range, and the flatter trajectory of your shells means it suddenly becomes worthwhile switching back to the armor piercing. That at least seems to be the theory. And also, because they're going to be spamming high explosive back at you, with the increased heal from your repair party consumable, your health should be in a much better state than theirs when you do reach brawling range and start exchanging armor piercing salvos. But there's more, and this is where it gets a little um, confusing, interesting, you be the judge. Good armour on tier 3 to 6 ships. Mighty British Dreadnoughts and Super Dreadnoughts are paving the way due to their armour, especially the bow armour belt. Now, I find that a little confusing. Because the belt armour is the armour down the sides of the ship. The bow armour is the armour at the front of the ship. So what's a bow armour belt? This I don't really understand. Until I see some numbers, it sounds like they're talking about giving British tier 3 to 6 battleships increased bow armour plating. And that's a bit of a game changer, because if British tier 3 to 6 battleships have heavier bow armour plating than other battleships of the same tier, then cruisers with 6 inch guns and the inertia fuse high explosive skill on their captains aren't going to be able to penetrate their bow plating anymore. And that's a fairly big deal. But note that it only says this for British battleships of tier 3 to 6. Well, what's up with the tier 7, 8, 9s and 10s? Well, this is where things get very, very confusing. From tier 7 up, they're talking about stealth battleships. <laughs> Concealment on tier 7 to 10 ships. Low tier vigour, 
is set aside in favour of higher tier cunning and stealthy playstyles. Proper concealment compensates for weak armour spots. Oh yeah. And allows for many tactical manoeuvres in a battle. So... They're talking about... It's two completely different playstyles, basically, for the British battleships. Tier 3, 4, 5 and 6. Very, very tanky battleships. Your, your typical American and German-style battleship gameplay. Just nose towards the enemy, get in there, do some damage. But then that changes completely from Tier 7, where you can't really do that anymore because apparently, and I quote, weak armour spots, which means Tier 7, 8, 9 and 10 British battleships are apparently supposed to rely on stealth. Now, the stats are up, although take them with a pinch of salt. Obviously, everything is still subject to change, but the stats are up for the British battleships on the World of Warships wiki page. And you can take a look and see exactly what they're talking about when they say stealthy battleships. They do have lower surface detection ranges than you would typically find on equivalent tier battleships of other nations. If you look at the current stats of the British Tier 10, the Conqueror, it's got a surface detection range that's about three kilometers less than, for example, the American Tier 10 battleship, the Montana. But there's no stealth firing in World of Warships anymore. The second you fire the guns, your surface detection range becomes the firing range of your guns. So while the Conqueror might have a surface detection range of 14.7 kilometers, once it fires its guns, it suddenly has a surface detection range of 24.3 kilometers. <laughs> Which basically means you get to fire the first shot, but you only get to fire the first shot if there's just you on a map alone against a Montana. This assumes that there aren't any enemy destroyers or cruisers within 14.7 kilometers of you that you can't see but can see you regardless of whether you'd fire your guns or not. And that's before we even get started on the whole idea of aircraft carriers which I believe for quite some time now we've had a method of spotting ships well in excess of the actual spotting range of the carrier itself. I believe we call them aircraft, don't we? Yes, that's right. <laughs> and let's not forget here, we're not talking about battleships that rival destroyers for sneakiness. We're only talking about a basic difference in surface detection ranges of two to three kilometers. So let's assume a best case scenario here. Let's say you're an HMS Conqueror and you don't get spotted by any sneaky destroyers or aircraft and you clap eyes on a Montana, 17.8 kilometers away. So you think, hey, fantastic, I get the first shot, and you start swinging your gun turrets around. <laughs> right, you're sailing towards him, he's sailing towards you. In the length of time it takes you to point the guns at the target and pull the trigger, you're going to have sailed inside detection range, and he's going to see you. And also, let's not forget, he's going to want to fire back, and you have, and I quote, weak armor spots. So now what are you going to do? Suddenly you found yourself in a fair fight with a Montana. Except you're not in a fair fight with a Montana because your armor is shit. <laughs> no joke. Uh, the Montana and the Yamato both have in excess of 400 millimeters of Citadel side armor. The Grosser Kerr first has 380 millimeters. The Conqueror 279. <laughs> yes, really, that's less than the Wall Spite, and that's tier 6. In fact, it's not that much more than the Dunkirk, and the Dunkirk is infamous for having terrible armour. So, yeah. Let's just say I'm not entirely convinced on this whole gimmick, because that's what it is. This gimmick of giving British high-tier battleships better surface concealment ratings as a substitute for having proper armour on the bloody things. Which brings us all the way back to the problem that I had, which I mentioned right at the beginning of this episode of Mingles with Jingles, and that hopefully you guys will be able to help me with. Because I've stockpiled all of this free experience in anticipation of unlocking all of these British battleships. But what if they suck? <laughs> because... They might. I mean, at the moment, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to have to play them before I render a final judgment. But And obviously, any stats that you see on the World of Warships wiki are subject to change and may even already be out of date. But at the same time, they might suck. And so I'm, 
I'm open to suggestions as to what I should spend the free experience on instead of the British battleships. This is where I am in World of Warships at the moment. I have 215,000 free experience, but that's just, you know, right now. I managed to earn that in two days of playing operations. So don't worry about how much free experience I have. Certainly by the time the British battleships come out, I'm going to have enough to blitz my way all the way up to the tier 10, and I might even have enough left over to get the USS Missouri as well. So the amount of free experience is not an issue. As you can see with the British cruisers, I've managed to unlock the Fiji, and I'm loving the Fiji. I think it's a fantastic ship. I've heard very good things about the Edinburgh, and the Neptune and the Minotaur are also both good ships. In my Japanese tech tree, I have to tell you it's been a real challenge this weekend to avoid blowing all that free XP instantly and unlocking and upgrading the Amagi, because the Amagi is a fantastic battleship. The only problem with the Amagi is it leads to the Izumo, and the Izumo is a bit of a dog. But I'm going to have enough free XP that I can just blast right through that with free XP and unlock the Yamato without ever having to play the Izumo. But it does... I don't know, it seems like a bit of a waste. Wargamen are very fond of doing this, aren't they? And they do it in all of their games, it's not just World of Warships. They stick a complete dog in the tech tree somewhere that only seems to exist for the specific purpose of driving you wild with frustration until you spend money on converting free experience and just skipping through it. At the same time, while I'm definitely going to have the free XP to skip my way through the Ismo, I... <sighs> How can I put this? I don't want to do it, because I feel as if Wargaming had beaten me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, the Ismo is so clearly a free XP sink uh, that I feel as if Wargaming have won if I use free XP to skip through it. But then again, you know, I've already spent the money. The, the free XP is there, so it's just a question of what I actually spend it on. You know, the, 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 I've all, they've already got my money, basically, at this point, so I may as well use it. Alternatively, there's always the Japanese destroyers. I've already unlocked the Kagero at Tier 8, but I'm not really feeling it with the Japanese higher tier destroyer gameplay. It's not like the happy hunting grounds that you have at Tier 4, 5 and 6, where everybody sells in straight lines because they're too dumb to know any better. <laughs> and, uh, um, at Tier 4, 5 and 6, you sit there dreaming about having torpedoes that can sink somebody from 10 kilometers away, because in the length of time, at those kind of tiers, more often than not, uh, let's say you do fire a torpedo at somebody 10 kilometers away. In the minute it takes the torpedoes to get there, he's not going to have changed course, and <laughs> you're going to sink him. That doesn't happen at Tier 8. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the happy hunting ground that it is at tier four, five, and six. By the time you get to tier eight, nine, and ten with Japanese destroyers, so I'm not I'm not really feeling it with the Japanese destroyers anymore. There's always the cruisers, of course. The Zhao at tier ten is a fantastic ship. Um, I've always wanted to get the Megami since I had it back in the beta test. That was as far as I got in the Japanese cruisers in the beta test. But the the Ibuki is a bit of an unknown factor. I don't think I can remember a single occasion when somebody sent me an Ibuki replay, which would suggest that nobody's doing well enough in the Ibuki to think it's worth sending the replays in. And, and yeah, I just don't know anything about it. You see, this is why I'm asking your opinions on what exactly I should do. There have to be some Ibuki players out there who can say whether the ship's worth getting or not. Or is it another free XP sink at Tier 9, just like the Ismo? Next up, the Americans. And there isn't a lot that I don't like about the American tech tree. I love the destroyers, I love the cruisers. I'm at tier 7 with the Mayhan in the destroyers, and I'm not far away from naturally unlocking the Benson, which leads to the fantastic Fletcher and gearing. With the cruisers, I have the New Orleans. I don't know about the Baltimore, though. It's, it's like the Japanese Ibuki at tier 9. I don't think I can ever remember somebody sending me a Baltimore replay. Is it a bad ship? I don't know. I know it leads to the Des Moines, and the Des Moines is a ship I've always wanted to get, but the question is, do I just free XP my way through the Baltimore, or do I actually buy it? And then, at some point, start playing it. So, Baltimore owners, what's it like? Is it worth keeping? Then, of course, you've got the American battleships. Now, the South Carolina at Tier 3 is an absolute disaster. <laughs> But as free XP sigs go, it's not too bad. It's only tier 3. You can skip that and not even notice. The Wyoming's okay. It's been a long time since I've played the New York, but I can remember quite liking it, although I'm not sure why. The New Mexico. Uh, the only thing I can remember about the New Mexico is bad. 
Um, <laughs> I cannot remember exactly why I have this bad memory of the New Mexico, but I, the one thing that clearly sticks in my mind is we used to have a saying, whichever team has the most New Mexico's loses. <laughs> uh, the Colorado is all right. Uh, the guns aren't fantastic, but it's a very tough ship. And then at tier 8, 9 and 10, you have the North Carolina, the Iowa and the Montana. Now, in my opinion, these are the sexiest looking ships in all of World of Warships. Opinion is, however, divided on how effective they are. <laughs> some people love them, some people hate them. The Iowa, for example, powerful guns, and that American armor-piercing is very, very, very good. The 16-inch armor-piercing shells are fantastic, but belt armor leaves a little something to be desired. I have seen an Iowa getting citadeled to death by a New Orleans, <laughs> and it's a tier 8 cruiser. So, yeah. Here's what I'm looking for. American high-tier battleship players, sell me your ships. And I don't mean sell me the ships, I mean sell me the idea of getting these ships. And it's going to be an easy sell, because I really like the way they look, because I'm a sucker for a good-looking ship. But I don't want to just sit there all day staring at them in my port. Although they are so good-looking, I could quite happily sit there staring at them all day in my port. But I do want to actually get out there and play them from time to time. So, American high-tier battleship players, that's, that's your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to convince me that the North Carolina, Iowa and Montana are worth playing. Next up, the Germans. Now this may be surprising for you, but I haven't bothered at all with the German battleships. And the reason I haven't bothered with the German battleships is because when I was playtesting them, I hated them. <laughs> I just couldn't get to grips with any of them except for the Bismarck. I thought the Bismarck was fantastic. The Nassau at tier 3 is a lot of fun as well. But the Kaiser, the Koenig, the Bayern, the Gneisenau, the Frederick the Great and the Grosser Kurfürst. I absolutely hated them. Mostly because of the horrifically bad inaccuracy of their main battery guns. But at tier 9 and 10 I thought they were especially bad because they're such huge massive targets. They're just great big floating torpedo magnets. And they're so big that cruiser high explosive spam is guaranteed to find something to set on fire on their superstructure. I am certainly prepared to admit, however, that it's entirely possible I've just been doing it wrong. So, while I am definitely inclined to just free XP my way right down the German battleship line to tier 8 and get myself a Bismarck without buying any of the other ships, is that the way to go? Or are the German battleship players out there who are going, right, challenge accepted, I will make jingles like and understand how to play and enjoy playing and be good at playing the other German battleships. I'm enjoying the German cruisers. I've made it as far as tier 6 in the Nuremberg. Haven't played the York yet and I can remember from playtesting the German cruisers that the York was um, it's a bit different isn't it because it's got those really really big 210 millimeter guns. Large calibre, terrible gun handling characteristics. So I'm not too sure about the York and I'm not really in any rush to spend any free XP on the Nuremberg, for example, and just unlock it and start playing it, because I'd, I seem to remember not liking it very much. Now, the Rune and the Hindenburg at tier 9 and 10. I can remember playtesting those two ships when I first got my hands on the German cruisers, and I could not wait. I mean, the Rune and the Hindenburg were the reasons why I started playing down the German cruiser line, and the reason for that was because of stealth firing. Do you remember how pissed off everybody used to get with the gearing and the Fletcher because they had something like a 2 to 2.5 kilometer uh, window in which they could shoot at you without being detected? Yeah? Do you remember how annoying that was? That was nothing! <laughs> that was Little League. The Hindenburg used to have a 6 kilometer window of opportunity, assuming you had the stealth, uh, sorry, the concealment module and the concealment expert skill on the captain, and you went for the. Um, uh, equipment modification that extended the range of your main battery guns. But if you did that with the Hindenburg, you could start shooting at somebody six kilometers before they were going to see you. And that and that alone convinced me I needed to play the German cruisers. And then Wargaming went and nerfed stealth firing, and that made me very, very sad. And suddenly I wasn't in quite as much of a rush to get myself to the German Tier 10 cruiser. I mean, I'm sure it's still a perfectly fine ship. But at the moment, the big roadblock I'm looking at 
is the York at tier 7. Those 210mm guns. So, any German cruiser captains out there who can tell me whether or not the York is something I should just free XP my way past, or is it worth actually buying and playing? And don't bother telling me about the German destroyers. I love the V-25 at tier 2 because it's absolutely hilarious, but the rest of them just don't interest me at all. And then there's the French. Now, I did like the French cruisers when I was playtesting them, and yet, as you can clearly see, I haven't actually bothered um, since they went live. And the reason for that is simply because I've just got too many fingers in too many different pies at the moment. There's only so many hours in the day I can be playing World of Warships, and I didn't really want to start going down a completely new tech tree when I still haven't finished with the Japanese, the French, the British, the Germans, and more on the Russians in a moment. But I don't think I'm going to be spending any free experience on the French cruisers, because I did enjoy playing the French cruisers, and so I think I'm probably going to do that. I'm going to play the French cruisers and just unlock them naturally, one after the other. Because I did enjoy playing them, and I'm, I don't want to just free XP my way through them. I, I want to actually play them. All of which brings us on to the Russians. Russian cruisers. I've liked all of the Russian cruisers that I've played so far. I'm at the Bajoni at Tier 6. I know I'm going to like the Shores, which is pretty much more of the same. The Chapayev's fantastic. The Dmitry Donskoy is fantastic. And Battleship Moskva at Tier 10. <laughs> I know it's going to be great. Now, I'm at Tier 5 with the Podvoisky, with the Soviet uh, destroyers. And I don't really care what the Genevni, the Minsk, the Kiev, or the Tashkent are like, because they lead to the Kabarovsk. <laughs> the Kabarovsk is the most ridiculously overpowered thing that has ever been in a computer game. I genuinely feel that the World of Warships developers that looked at World of Tanks and all the claims and Russian bias in World of Tanks with the Soviet heavies and the mediums and so on and so on and so on, and they said, well, I'm not going to let that happen in World of Warships. And, and so they, they kind of restrained themselves just a little bit when they were developing the Soviet cruisers. I mean, they're all very, very good, but you couldn't really call any of them ridiculously overpowered. And the same with the Soviet destroyers. Until you get to tier 10. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like Peter Jackson when he was directing The Hobbit. Uh, you know, the first movie in the Hobbit trilogy. Uh, we're kind of used to spectacle when we watch a Peter Jackson movie, the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, there's a certain element of special effects on display. And yet The Hobbit was quite restrained. There was no sense of spectacle. It's almost as if Peter Jackson, they had... I had a bunch of people sitting on him saying, no, Peter, no, no, go easy on the special effects, Peter. And then when they got right to the end, the bit in Goblin Town, it's just, it's just like he, he threw people off him. <laughs> he just jizzed special effects. He couldn't hold it in any longer. And he just jizzed special effects all over the screen. And, and it was just too much. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I feel that the World of Warships developers had a similar experience when they were putting the Soviet ships into the game. They kind of restrained themselves a bit with the cruisers, they restrained themselves with the destroyers just a bit, just a little bit, but when they got to tier 10 and the Kavarovsk, they just couldn't take it anymore, and they all shouted, at the same time! <laughs> <laughs> and the Kavarovsk was born. This is a destroyer. <laughs> that can go faster than some of the torpedoes in World of Warships. It has eight guns that fire 12 shots per minute, and the armour on this thing... This thing has 50mm of side plating armour. Now, you might be sitting there thinking 50mm is nothing, and you're right, it is nothing, but remember, destroyers don't have citadels, and a destroyer with 50mm of armour, what that means is that it has enough armour so that high explosive shells shatter <laughs> and don't do any damage, and not enough armour to arm the fuses of armour-piercing shells so they all over-penetrate and do only 10% of their damage potential. And they don't hit a citadel on the way because it's a destroyer and it doesn't have a citadel. I have seen numerous replays where people in Tier 10 cruisers have had a Kabarovsk well within shooting range, and they just don't bother. <laughs> because shooting at a Kabarovsk is a waste of time. 
So I'm going to be getting one of these. <laughs> Because of Russian. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not being critical here. I actually quite respect the World of Warships developers in St. Petersburg for exercising some restraint over their fierce national patriotism and only putting one ridiculously overpowered Soviet ship. Well, OK, two, because there's the, uh, the Grozovoy at Tier 10 is basically the same ship. Well, all right, three. The Imperator Nikolai I, the premium Tier 4 battleship, is ridiculous as well. And, well, you could say the Mamansk. <laughs> Premium Tier 5 cruiser. It's an Omaha, or it's what the Omaha wishes it was. I mean, it's better than the Omaha in every way that matters. But four's not bad. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> they only put four... Well, yeah... What the, yeah, the, the Kuchizov is a little bit ridiculous as well. I mean, the fact that it can fire 152mm guns out further than most ships can fire 203mm guns, and it has so many of them, and it was the first cruiser in the game to have a smokescreen. I'd better stop counting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'm going to be getting a Kabarovsk. All of this does bring me on to the one other thing that I wanted to talk about in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, and it's, well, it's World Warships in particular, but it's, it's well, game development in general. It's an issue that we've seen already happening in World of Tanks, and it's, well, when you come to introduce a new nation into a game like this, or even a new line in an existing nation like this, British battleships, for example, and you want to try to make them different from everything that you already have in the game, it doesn't take too long before you start running out of options and have to start throwing, well, gimmicks in there instead. World of Tanks hasn't actually done too badly. It's quite surprising how World of Tanks has managed, at least, to avoid doing what World of Warships is already doing in order to make any particular nation different from the other nations. Although the differences in World of Tanks aren't as pronounced as they are in World of Warships. I mean, you've got, for example, the Soviet heavies, they're big heavily armoured, big guns, they're, they're very newbie friendly, and then the Soviet mediums tend to be fast, um, good turrets, rapid firing guns, high manoeuvrability, but you could argue that's the same with the American mediums. See the differences between the different nations? I mean there are distinct flavours there in World of Tanks, but the differences aren't quite as pronounced as they are in World of Warships. And that's a problem for World of Warships because it hasn't been out that long and they're already starting to run out of options in ways that they can make any one nation different from another nation. It was nice and straightforward at first in World of Warships, when all you had were the Americans and the Japanese, and the Americans didn't have battleships, and the Japanese didn't have carriers. So it was really just the cruisers and the destroyers, and the Japanese cruisers had the torpedoes. Um, the Japanese destroyers also had the torpedoes, their guns were terrible. The American cruisers had the anti-aircraft firepower, and the American destroyers had the rapid-firing, rapid-turning guns. So, bingo, there you go. Those were the differences. Then they introduced the Japanese carriers, and to this day I still couldn't really tell you what the difference is between the Japanese carriers and the American carriers, and that's not because there are no differences, it's because I don't know the first thing about carriers in World of Warships. Uh, but the one thing that I did notice was that the Japanese carriers, the squadrons weren't as big. There weren't as many aircraft in each squadron as they were on the American carriers, so that was a thing, I suppose. And then the American battleships. Well, we got the war spike before we got the American battleships, didn't we? Premium tier 6 British battleship, and everybody said, wow, the war spike, its guns are terrible, because Japanese battleships could fire out to a range of 20 kilometers, and the war spike could only do 16 and a half, I can't remember exactly. And then we got the American battleships, and funnily enough, most of the American battleships can't fire much further than 16 and a half kilometers either. And it wasn't that the Wallspite just had bad guns, it was that the Japanese battleships had long-range guns. That was the Japanese battleship thing. And the American battleship thing was tough as old boots, at least up until Tier 7. <laughs> and, uh, and then you had the North Carolina, the Iowa, and the Montana. So you could see the differences between the Americans and the Japanese. So, how are the German battleships different from the Japanese battleships and the American battleships? What's distinctly German about them? Well, they're as tough as old boots for one thing. Fantastic secondary batteries, and generally speaking, their main calibre guns would be lower calibre than equivalent battleships of other nations. When other nations are 
rocking 16 inch guns, the Germans have got 15 inch guns. When other nations are rocking 14 inch guns, the Germans are rocking 12 or 11 inch guns. Soviets, still a couple of things we can play around with, and with the Soviets they messed around with turret rotation speed and maneuverability. Both the Soviet cruisers and destroyers tend to be pretty fast, but only really in a straight line. They don't turn particularly well, and while they have good guns, those gun turrets don't turn very quickly either, and in the destroyers particularly, and also in several of the cruisers, it's entirely possible to pull a hard turn and outturn your gun turrets, be completely unable to keep the guns pointing at the target. So that's kind of the Soviet thing. And then we come on to the British cruisers, and there's, there's two ways of looking at what happened with the British cruisers. You can take the charitable view and say, Wargaming said, we want to do something different with the British cruisers. Or you could take the cynical view and say, this is the point where Wargaming ran out of ideas. <laughs> they ran out of options because there are only so many variables you can play around with to make one nation different from other nations. And the more nations you introduce, with a limited pool of variables to mess around with, the harder it is to make a new nation different. What they could have done, and what I think a lot of people were expecting and hoping they were going to do with the British cruisers, was to make the British cruisers battle cruisers. Britain was famous for its battle cruisers. It was one of the few nations in the world that actually fully embraced the whole concept of battle cruisers. We had dozens of battle cruisers. We had battle cruisers coming out of the yin yang. They put battle cruisers in the game. You could argue that the Scharnhorst is a battle cruiser. It's not really. You could argue that the Graf Spee is a battle cruiser. It is. Battle cruisers. Cruisers with battleship guns. They've done something similar to this in World of Tanks, believe it or not. The Chinese mediums. They're medium tanks, but you can put heavy tank guns on them. They're basically the World of Tanks version of battle cruisers. They could have done that in World of Warships with the British cruisers. Instead, they chose to give us a line of gimmick light cruisers instead, none of which have guns bigger than 6 inch, which is a bit of a pain in the arse, because they were tailor-made for the inertia fuse high explosive shell skill, but none of the British cruisers fire high explosive. <laughs> They're gimmicks. They get semi-armor piercing instead. They get a heel from tier 3 and up, which no other cruisers get until at least tier 9. They get smoke screens, which is a destroyer specific thing, and premium tier 8 Soviet cruiser thing. Um, they're just a line of gimmicks. This was the point where Wargaming started messing around with the consumables available to ships, in lieu of actually making the ships themselves different. You see the same thing happening with the French cruisers. What makes the French cruisers different from everybody else? Well, they're fast. Yeah. So are the Russians. Um, they've got accurate guns. So are the Russians. Um, they're manoeuvrable. So are the British and the Americans. It's their consumable. It's the speed boost consumable. It, it's better on the French cruisers than on anybody else. It buffs their speed by 15 to 20 percent compared to just 10 percent for everybody else. They're messing around with the consumables because they're running out of things that they can actually change on the ships to make them any different from any other nation. And I think with the British battleships, we're reaching the extreme limit of what it is you can actually do with the stats of the ships in order to make them different. And while the proof is going to be in the playtesting, I have serious concerns about the British tier 7, 8, 9 and 10. Because if they're going to have terrible armour but an improved heal, and the ability to maybe, possibly, under the best possible set of circumstances, get the first shot off, all that means is you're turning the British tier 7, 8, 9 and 10 battleships into XP pinatas for the enemy team. There's a British battleship, his armour is terrible, shoot him up, he'll heal it back, you can shoot him up again, <laughs> and, and farm all kinds of experience and damage on them. That's what's gonna happen. We'll play test them, we'll see how they perform out on the live server, and we'll reserve judgement until then but I'm stockpiling a load of free XP. I'm hoping to be able to spend it on the British battleships, but I'm keeping my options open. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. And that's about it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. You see what happens when I talk about a subject that I'm actually passionate about. <laughs> you can't shut me up, and you end up with a 35-minute episode. Jingles, back in the day, used to do 40-minute episodes of 
yeah, what can I say? I'm old and I'm tired and I need to go to bed because right now it's 3.46 in the morning and I haven't even started rendering this video. So I'm going to cut it short there. I hope you enjoyed the episode anyway. I hope you had a great weekend and my commiserations, but forget it because it's Monday. <laughs> Take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.